Up first, Jason Kenney. He is the Minister for Citizenship, Immigration and Multiculturalism and the MP for Calgary Southeast, and we're glad you could visit us in TVO today. Great to be here, Steve. The new Citizenship Guide devotes a lot of time to Canada's military past. Why do new Canadians need to know a lot about that? It's essential to who we are. Some of our defining moments in history revolve around our, our military past. In the previous guide, the one we've just replaced, there was not a single word about the 110,000 Canadians who gave their lives in the defense of our country. There wasn't a word about Vimy Ridge, Juneau Beach, or Dieppe, about those not just as historic events, but defining events in terms of our values, our willingness to make sacrifices with other democratic nations in the protection of freedom and our values. So I don't think can new Canadians or native-born Canadians can know Canada if they don't know about those military sacrifices and how they helped to shape our country. War of 1812 gets mentioned, the two world wars, as you pointed out, get mentioned. It only mentions peacekeeping once. Why such a lack of emphasis on that? I wouldn't say it's a lack of emphasis. In the previous guide, the one we replaced, there was only mention of peacekeeping, which is bizarre, frankly, uh, to think that we wouldn't mention the First or Second World War, uh, where a million Canadians served in uniform and 110,000 gave their lives. Um, peacekeeping is an important dimension of the post-Second War uh, Canadian mi military involvement. We talk about our involvement in, in international security and peace missions in the United Nations. It's part of the history. It's not alone the history. Okay, but if you... My hunch is that if people think about the Canadian military contribution, obviously before Afghanistan, they're thinking peacekeeping, they're thinking Lester Pearson won a Nobel Prize for right. it, they're thinking Canada made a big peacekeeping uh, contribution to the world in 1956 with the Suez Crisis. In fact, we were offside with Britain in that one. Um, peacekeeping, I think, was the mission of our forces for probably two generations. So why don't new Canadians need to know more about that? Well, in the 1950s, we were uh, not exactly peacekeeping in the UN mission uh, in Korea, we were involved in a real conflict. Uh, today, we're in a UN mission in Afghanistan, uh, which is a real conflict. Um, our mission in uh, the Balkans wasn't uh, simply observing uh, two sides with binoculars; it was getting in. And, so and you and want the emphasis on the on, on the wars? I want I want the emphasis on facts in history, not myths. Okay. Here's what the Toronto Star reported uh, just a couple of days ago. The booklet connects some, if not all, of the dots between the rise of Quebec nationalism and the subsequent advent of the Official Languages Act. It describes Quebec's quest for autonomy as a live element of the Canadian debate. A House of Commons 2006 Nation Resolution is mentioned. The authors tiptoed their way through this previously ignored minefield. The same cannot be said of the section that deals with gender equality. The booklet warns that, quote, barbaric cultural practices that tolerate spousal abuse, honor killings, female genital mutilation or other gender-based violence are punishable crimes in this country. In the more innocent Canada of 1995, such an admonition would have been unthinkable. That's Chantal Hébert. A couple of things here that we want to unpack. First on the French-English issue. Given that the government wants new Canadians to believe in a united Canada, of course, how wise was it to get into all of the divisions that have sort of led us to where we are today? Look, the objective of the book is to give uh, both new and native-born Canadians a full picture of the value symbols and institutions that are rooted in Canadian history. We want to deepen a sense of what our shared citizenship is, what the common values are. That means we have to have what some people call civic literacy. We need to have a basic alphabet, a basic vocabulary of the facts that occurred in our past. We can always have a debate about what the meaning of those facts were, or different interpretations about how and why they happened. But the reality of the Quebec nationalist movement, rooted in the reality of uh, the foundation of New France and uh, the, 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 the British um, Empire maintaining a, a space for the French Catholic culture in Canada, that's all an essential part of our story of pluralism, of accom accommodation of differences. Big minefield, too, though. It is. Big and, minefield. And look, the easier thing to do would be to come out with a book that's just politically correct pablum, as the previous book did. Didn't even mention. Um, Canada before Confederation. It hardly mentioned how Confederation happened at all. And if all you knew about Canada came from that book, you wouldn't even know that the national c question in Quebec is one of the central political issues of, the, of, of our time. How can you expect new Canadians, or new Quebec Canadians for that matter, to become citizens, voting active members of our political community, if they don't even know what the central issues of modern Canadian political history is. Okay, let me pick up the second part of Chantel's quote, which is, why did you feel it necessary to include such strong language about genital mutilation and honor killings and this kind of thing? Look, uh, I think there may be some people who, uh, with the discourse of multiculturalism, have misinterpreted our respect for cultural difference as extending to uh, 
allowing a justification for brutal and, in fact, illegal practices uh, in Canada. What we want to be clear is, is on this. Multiculturalism in Canada means a positive respect for what's best about our different cultural backgrounds. It does not extend uh, to those practices which, let's be honest, I mean, we, again, we could be politically correct about this or we could be direct and honest. The reality is there are some countries of origin uh, from which people immigrate to Canada where uh, treating women like, like uh, second-class citizens, um, uh, practices like honor killings, are, per are permitted or are culturally accepted. They are not in Canada. And I think we owe it to people to be absolutely clear about this. I want to be clear as well that obviously uh, abuse of, of women and spousal abuse is not limited to the homes of, of new no, Canadians. But there, are, but, but there are particular cultural practices that we find abhorrent, and we think people should be aware of that. They're, they're, they're really very few and far between when these things happen. And I, I guess some people are wondering whether or not you're feeding a negative stereotype of these groups by including something that happens, you know, very rarely in this country once people come here. Well, I would challenge that it's that rare, uh, Steve. There's not, I think, that we don't have reliable statistics on how often these things happen. All I can tell you is, as uh, in my capacity as Minister for Multiculturalism, I'm in a non-stop year-round roundtable with members of our cultural and immigrant communities. And a lot of women uh, in many communities tell me this is a very serious problem. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's healthy to have an open and respectful discussion about this to say that multiculturalism does have its limits. It doesn't it does not imply a kind of cultural relativism where even br brutally, brutal, historically grounded cultural practices can be accepted in Canada. Could you have gone further and said, it's not consistent with Canadian values to have women walking the streets of Mississauga in burqas? You know, I get the, there's a debate about that. Uh, uh, my own personal view uh, is uh, the sort of British liberal view that the government shouldn't be telling people what they do and don't wear. Um, we're talking here about practices that are clearly illegal, uh, that, that are a violation of people's rights. And beyond that, if people want to have a, a discussion about, uh, about other cultural practices, they're, they're welcome to it. The guide also discusses what it calls Canada's founding peoples, the English, the French, the Aboriginals, at length. Again, why do new Canadians need to know about this? Um, because, again, again, this is not the audience, it's not just new Canadians, it's all Canadians. And I, I say that my concern is that uh, civic illiteracy, if you will, is as much or more of a problem amongst young native-born Canadians than amongst new Canadians, because at least, na new, na native, uh, at least new Canadians have had to go through some kind of citizenship uh, step test process. But look, uh, we are maintaining the world's highest relative levels of immigration. 0.8% of our population, a quarter of a million newcomers a year, 175,000 new citizens. Mm -hmm. No country in history has maintained that kind of velocity of demographic change. It's a tremendous benefit to our society, but we also have to recognize that it presents certain challenges. We want a, a, a diverse country that's characterized by social cohesion uh, and by people successfully integrating, not assimilating, but successfully integrating into our society. And part of that is having a common vocabulary about our values, symbols, history, and institutions. But it, that's the, that vocabulary is presented to people in this book. Okay. Would it give the impression, though, that if you're not French or not English or not Aboriginal, you're somehow... You know, you're not original. You're, you're, you're a second-class citizen in some respects. No, of course not. In fact, uh, I recently named a, a new award for excellence in promoting multiculturalism after Paul Yutzik, who responded to that critique in the 1950s and 60s, saying there is the what he called the third force in Canada, the one-third of Canadians who had, at that time, neither French, British, nor Aboriginal backgrounds. We honor the, the contribution of, uh, of, of, of immigrants to Canada, throughout our history in the book. We talk about diversity and multiculturalism in positive terms. Why doesn't the guide address the really quite appalling circumstances in which too many Aboriginal Canadians live in this country? Well, I, I think it does. It says that, that, that Aboriginal talks, for instance, about uh, the injustices of the Aboriginal uh, residential schools. It mentions the apology. It talks about uh, conflicts in the past it's, in, in pre-confederation pre That's all history. history. That's, not, that's not really today. That's all history. Well, look, we're trying to strike a balance here. I think we've done pretty well, and most commentators have commented on the fact that this is a realistic view of Canada. Uh, it covers the high points. It talks about great heroes, but it also covers some of the periods of the, the, the darker and more moments of injustice in our history, including those that have happened to Aboriginals. But we're not... I don't want to em embrace a kind of black armband approach to Canadian identity and say everything is terrible uh, and this country is irredeemably... Uh, uh, locking out people from opportunity. Look, there are challenges. There are challenges for newcomers. There are challenges for Aboriginals. Um, 
we're all working on those together. But I think the book is balanced in that regard. Here's John Iveson in the net. You'd be disappointed if I didn't talk a little politics with you about this book. Um, yes, we're, we've talked a lot of public policy, but let's talk politics too. John Iveson in the National Post. The new citizenship guide might easily be dismissed as a glossy brochure, but that underestimates the thought and effort that went into it. This is not tinsel. It's symbolism and is yet another incremental step in the rebranding of Canada into a conservative country, small c, full of people more inclined to vote conservative, big C. The new guide is heavy on military history, the Maple Leaf, and Canada's heroes, even if the casual reader is left wondering if gay marriage is legal. Anyone just weeks removed from steerage who reads the new guide will think conservative values, big C, of unabashed patriotism, pride in the armed forces, and support for the rule of law are synonymous with Canadian values. And I guess the question that comes out of this is, are we in danger of politicizing our national history? Absolutely not. I know you're going to say no, but tell me why. Uh, in part because we, we constructed this new guide uh, with advice from historians um, and experts right across the political spectrum. I think there are probably more people here associated with large or small uh, liberal orientations than, than conservative. Well, name We've, names, because I think people may have heard of some of them. Well, uh, I can tell you that, for instance, uh, the, the Dominion Institute was involved in this. Um, the, uh, there are people there with a variety of different political backgrounds. Uh, John Ralston Saul. John Ralston Saul. We, con we consulted Linda Haverstock, the former leader of the Saskatchewan Liberal Party. We consulted uh, Senator Serge Joyal, who's a Liberal uh, Senator. Uh, I could go on. The point is that there's a very diverse group of, of people in terms of their political orientation, all of whom I think agree, agree on one thing, that we need a better knowledge of Canadian value symbols, institutions, and history. They've, we've tried to reflect that in this document. You won't, uh, you, I, I think that we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, I don't think any of them are visible minorities, though, or any of the major players behind the scenes in this thing were visible minorities. Well, that, uh, that's not fair. Professor Randy Boyagoda of, of uh, Ryerson, and obviously uh, ex Her Excellency uh, Ms. Clarkson. But uh, look, I'm somebody who is in touch with, uh, with uh, immigrant communities and cultural communities constantly, and they say to me that they are ambitious to know more about Canada. Um, and. Uh, uh, this is this is going to help people increase their literacy. Uh, there's nothing here, I think, that could be fairly described as carrying a political agenda. Yes, it celebrates our our, our military past, um, just as it marks some of the tragic moments in our history. It doesn't. What it doesn't do is whitewash or sandblast out of our history central parts of it, such as the sacro. You know, Vimy Ridge is not a liberal or a conservative fact. It's a Canadian fact. And if it's if it's, uh, I, I think it's. Um, ridiculous to suggest that pride and knowledge about central moments like that is in any way political. Okay, let, let me continue the ridiculousness then, because here's something from Tom Flanagan in his book, Harper's Team, where he says, the traditional conservative base of Anglophone, Anglophone Protestants is too narrow to win modern Canadian elections. The key long-term success of the Liberals has been their cultivation of minority groups. We have to, we meaning conservatives, have to take away that advantage before we can become the dominant political force in the country. So, um, I know that that statement is not in that book. I get that. But having said that, are you going to really fight me very hard on the notion that this may, at the end of the day, be helpful to Conservative Party fortunes? Uh, yeah. You I, are I, going to fight me on that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, we mention uh, values here that I think New Democrats would see. Quebec nationalists have, have applauded this book, reasonable ones, as, as being much more reflective of the centrality and the reality of French Canadians and Canadian history. Um, it's true. I have a different. I have a mandate as well, to a political mandate to reach out on behalf of our government and my party uh, to new Canadians and cultural communities. I do that all the time. But Steve, if I was, frankly, uh, interested in uh, leveraging the citizenship process for political gain, I would be make. I would be lowering the bar rather than raising it. One of my predecessors, Joe Volpe, for instance, reduced the age exemption for writing the citizenship test from 65 to 55, making it easier for se seniors not to have to have a, any language proficiency or knowledge about Canada to become voting Canadian citizens. I'm moving this in the other direction. I'm taking some risks in saying we're ambitious for new Canadians to know more about Canada, to have better language proficiency. We're actually raising the bar a little bit here. Uh, that's actually to the uh, ar arguably against the political interest that people are accusing me sometimes of being motivated by. Okay. In our last 30 seconds here, this interview wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about hockey, because that, of course, is an important part of Canadian citizenship. So the guide says Wayne Gretzky is one of the greatest hockey players of all time, no. which I don't think you're going to get much <laughs> of an argument on. 
But I'm curious as to why you put that in there, because last I checked, you're a Calgary MP. <laughs> and aren't you worried that you're going to start creating too much support for the Edmonton Oilers as opposed to the Calgary Flames? <laughs> and that could cost you votes, Mr. Kenny. I'm warning you. That could do it. That's a very good question, Steve. But I have to admit, I grew up in Oakville, and as a kid, uh, the Maple Leafs were our kind of family secular religion. So oh. and th this is where we end <laughs> the But there's a great right picture now. of the Montreal Canadiens here. And I have to tell you, when I was in Montreal last night, people were absolutely thrilled to see the 1979 Canadien winning the Stanley, Stanley Cup uh, being celebrated in the Citizenship Guide. Just lost all the votes in the 416. All that work <laughs> you did right down the drain. Jason Kenney, Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and Multiculturalism. Good of you to visit us at TVO tonight. Thanks. Thank you very much.